Greetings and thank you all for joining us this evening. I'm Susanna Clark, director of the Mahindra Humanities Center and the Morton B. Knopfel Professor of Music at Harvard University. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to today's literary conversation featuring Harry Kunzru. Our interviewer today is Duncan White, who is also the convener, convener of this Mahindra Center Writer Speak series. Duncan will introduce Harry Kunzru in just a moment, but before I hand things over, let me say a few words of introduction about Duncan. He is Associate Director of Studies in History and Literature here at Harvard University. He is an acclaimed journalist and author of nonfiction. Duncan White's most recent book, Cold Warriors, Writers Who Waged the Literary Cold War, was named a 2019 Sunday Times Book of the Year. He is a lead book critic for the Daily, Daily Telegraph in the UK and regular contributor to the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal. Thank you all for joining us. And I am delighted to th turn things over to you, Duncan. Uh, thank you, Susie, um, for those uh, uh, um, very kind words. Um, I'm delighted to be introducing uh, Hari Kunzru today, who's one of my um, favorite writers. Um, he's the author of six novels, uh, many essays and stories, and uh, Renaissance man that he is, has now um, uh, developed a brilliant podcast of which I'm a, to which I'm a recent convert called Into the Zone. By turns comic, thrilling and unsettling, his fiction is rich in ideas, exploring everything from globalization, UFOs, psychedelics, blues music, the Stasi, the early internet, and perhaps even scarier, the late internet. His two most recent novels are White Tears and Red Pill. The former, an account of two young white hipsters, um, both of whom are kind of audiophiles who invent, in scare quotes, a blues uh, record, an act that awakens the ghosts of a violent and vengeful history. Red Pill is the story of a writer who goes to Berlin to work on a book only to suffer a breakdown that takes him on a dizzying path to a confrontation with a sinister avatar of the alt-right. Um, and uh, I think we're going to uh, start off, excitingly, with um, an excerpt from Red Pill, but it's my great pleasure to introduce Harry. Duncan, thank you so much. Um, and hello, everybody. Thank you for, for turning out tonight or staying in tonight, whatever whatever we're actually supposed to say on Zoom a year or two into this. I'm still not quite sure what the what the etiquette is. But yeah, I'm going to read from uh, the beginning of uh, Red Pill when because it's the beginning, uh, I really don't need to contextualize it any further. So um, I will just dive in. I think it's possible to track the onset of middle age exactly. It's the moment when you examine your life and instead of a field of possibility opening out, an increase in scope, you have a sense of waking up from sleep or being washed up on shore newly conscious of your surroundings. So this is where I am, you say to yourself. This is what I've become. It's when you first understand that your condition physically intellectually, socially, financially, is not absolutely mutable, that what has already happened will, to a great extent, determine the rest of the story. What you've done cannot be undone, and much of what you've been putting off for later will never get done at all. In short, your time is a finite and dwindling resource. From this moment on, whatever you're doing, whatever joy or intensity or whirl of pleasure you may experience, You'll never shake the almost imperceptible sensation that you're traveling on a gentle downward slope into darkness. For me, this realization of mortality took place, conventionally enough, beside my sleeping wife at home in our apartment in Brooklyn. As I lay awake, listening to her breathing, I knew that my strength and ingenuity had their limits. I could foresee a time when I would need to rest. How I got there was a source of amazement to me, the chain of events that had led me to that slightly overheated bedroom, to a woman who had things turned out differently, I might never have met or recognized as the person I wanted to spend my life with. 
After five years of marriage, I was still in love with Ray and she was still in love with me. All that was settled, a happy fact. Our three-year-old daughter was asleep in the next room. Our very happiness made me uneasy. It was a perverse reaction. I knew I was like a miser fretting about his emotional hoard. Yet the mental rats running round my bedroom, round my child's bedroom, had something real behind them. It was a time when the media was full of images of children hurt and displaced by war. I frequently found myself hunched over my laptop, my eyes welling with tears. I was distressed by what I saw, but also haunted by a more selfish question. If the world changed, would I be able to protect my family? Could I scale the fence with my little girl on my shoulders? Would I be able to keep hold of my wife's hand as the rubber boat overturned? Our life together was fragile. One day something would break. One of us would have an accident, one of us would fall sick, or else the world would slide further into war and chaos, engulfing us as it had so many other families. In most respects, I had little to complain about. I lived in one of the great cities of the world. Save for a few minor ailments, I was physically healthy. And I was loved, which protected me from some of the more destructive consequences of a so-called midlife crisis. I had friends who, without warning, embarked on absurd sexual affairs, or in one case developed a ruinous crack habit that he kept hidden from everyone until he was arrested at 3am in Elizabeth, New Jersey, smoking behind the wheel of his parked car. I was not about to fuck the nanny or gamble away our savings, but at the same time, I knew there was something profoundly but subtly wrong. Some urgent question I had to answer that concerned me in isolation and couldn't be solved by waking Ray or going on the internet or padding barefoot into the bathroom and swallowing a sleeping pill. It concerned the foundation for things, beliefs I'd spent much of my life writing and thinking about, various claims I made for myself in the world. And coincidentally or not, it arrived at a time when I was about to go away. One reason I was awake, worrying about money and climate change and Macedonian border guards, was that an airport transfer was booked for five in the morning. I never sleep well on the night before I have to travel. I'm always nervous that I'll oversleep and miss my plane. And so that's how it begins. And uh, the anxiety that the, the central character, this writer, feels begins to kind of uh, unravel his life in a very profound way uh, i don't know what the, the phrase is it like feeling seen or feeling triggered by the, the, <laughs> the middle-aged meltdown um it's a it's a, a sort of very unsettling opening to the book especially you know given the title red pill um you know in some ways you know the book opens you know, you you sort of almost how he threatened the reader with quite a boring story in some senses of a man goes to write a book about lyric poetry in Germany, which could, you know, <laughs> be not the most promised. But then, of course, we have even from those opening pages and from the title, this sense of impending threat. Could you maybe talk a little bit through about the idea of red pilling and maybe why you kind of latched onto that as a sort of idea for this novel? Sure. I mean, I mean, I think a lot of people will know that the origin of the phrase the red pill is is in the film The Matrix, the the 90 science fiction movie and the central character in that film, Neo, um, Keanu Reeves, is offered a choice. Um, he's you know, he, he can take a blue pill, in which case everything that uh, about his world will stay the same. Or he can take a red pill and he, he, and in that case, he'll see the world as it really is. And in this film the world as it is is this horrifying dystopia in which um humans are being used as sort of batteries for some kind of uh uh cosmic alien machine you know we're raw material where you know we're absolutely unfree um and this phrase then has a has a very strange kind of meandering history it first got picked up by pickup artists by uh, men on the internet who were trying to kind of systematize the business of seducing women. And uh, for them, the red pill was, uh, I mean, this, we're talking now about the early aughts, I think that it, it was a phrase for a kind for kind of realizing inverted commas that, uh, that there were tips and tricks. You could psychologically kind of uh, coerce women into sleeping with you. But after that, it got picked up that it sort of, it was sort of going around in these quite kind of uh, 
misogynist circles and um and it became picked up by the far right and by the the, the sort of internet enabled far right you know we call the alt right these days as a, as a as a phrase for for sort of conversion to their worldview then there's a there's a very sort of uh common frame um that you find on the right wing internet where whereby normies or people of the mainstream are considered to be sort of prisoners of a particular kind of screen reality which is generated by uh, a kind of hegemonic liberal media that uh, dominates to such an extent that we can't see the truth behind things and that if you take the the um the white supremacist red pill suddenly you realize that uh all these things that the media isn't telling you are true and that the world picture of uh, of the outright is in fact correct so you find people asking each other are you red pilled on the jq which means are you red pilled on the jewish question i.e are you a holocaust denier um and so this this but this idea of 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 kind of having a privileged access to the real that the that the masses don't have is, is a very seductive idea and a particularly to a kind of um i mean it's almost like a sort of bohemian idea i mean you can you can think of someone the sort of uh baudelarian figure who's you know the 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 lone connoisseur of the of the the truth you know in, in opposition to the to the the sheeple the the, the mass but there's a i mean it's it, this this worldview i think has been very responsible for the increased popularity of these this kind of extreme right politics on you know among younger people so i mean so my use of it really is is a kind of slightly ironized use i suppose i mean it's the 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 idea i mean i've i've created a writer who um is i mean he he shares some biographical uh details with me but he is uh he's a uh, he's quite he's a uh, uh let, let's say a slightly more complacent uh character than i am with a slightly with a slightly more uh traditional set of notions about the importance of of um of poetry and of 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 the arts and uh and what happens to him in the course of the story is a kind of exposure to this uh um to the kind of I know at one point um I think uh uh I'm black I'm blanking on the 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 actor who's who plays opposite uh Reeves in the movie but anyway he says welcome to the desert of the real um and this is this is the kind of experience the lifting of a particular veil of of uh of comfort about the possibilities of the world that happened to this happened to this character during the course of the uh of the book and um he doesn't do well with this confrontation his ideas and his kind of picture of things don't hold up in a in a very uh coherent or meaningful way and so that i mean that's a kind of confrontation i wanted to stage because i think it's a confrontation that a lot of people have had over the last few years i think there's been a sense amongst a particular generation of let's say fairly comfortable liberal leaning folk that their world picture was essentially correct and wasn't going to be subject to any more challenges. It's sort of, you know, it's sort of an end of history idea to use that sort of Fukuyama uh, idea that everybody kind of kicks him for. Um, the, you know, clearly history has not ended and we seem to be getting more and more of it all the time. And, uh, and actually the ground seems to be shifting under a sort of post Second World War liberal consensus. So, I mean, there's a lot more in play socially and politically than I certainly would have ever thought in back in the 1990s. Um, and, I, and that was a reason for writing this, this book in this way was to, as I say, to stage that kind of confrontation. Yeah, I mean, we could talk about the complacency of the 90s uh, uh, a lot, but I, I, I actually want to sort of pick up, because it's important, like both when and where this takes place, right? Because this is, I guess the novel begins early-ish in, in 2016, and of course, it's taking place in Wannsee, like, you know, on the outskirts of Berlin. Um, you know, I know that you went out to, to, to Germany yourself on a writing fellowship. I was just wondering how you could talk, talk us through how, how kind of this location became so important at that particular moment in history. Well, I mean, Berlin is a, is a city where it's very hard to escape a kind of layered sense of of history i mean obviously it has 
it has not one but two experiences of totalitarianism and it has um it has you know it has this geography that still you know once you kind of attune yourself to it very present the east and the west of the the city even though the physical infrastructure of the wall and so on is largely gone um you can kind of tell by certain sort of cultural things whether you're crossing to, from east to west and then vanze is a sort of summer place it's a it's a place of of of, sort of weekend entertainment there's a um there's a there's a famous 1920s film called Berlin on Sunday or People on Sunday I think it's called which shows everybody coming out of the city to kind of uh, to 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 swim in the lake and so on but then of course it becomes known and and if people do know the name Wannsee at all they know it for the Wannsee conference which was this meeting where the the details of the final solution were were uh, established by senior Nazis and so and that house that, that where, where that took place is is on the lake so there's this kind of uh particular pall of history that hangs over over the place um and you know for, for me it's it was very interesting to kind of confront berlin as a as a sort of warning from the past but also to look at the present day of germany now i was there and the, i've set the book at the moment just after Angela Merkel famously said, you know, wir schaffen das, we can handle the influx of refugees. So that, I mean, I was around when there were a million or so new, largely Syrian and Afghan people in the city who were being housed in, in gymnasiums and in all sorts of, in, in, in the airport and so on. And I had some contact with those people, somebody I was, I was working with at the, the the residency was actually running a children's choir for refugee children. So I visited various places associated with them, and um, and and often and actually was in many on several occasions kind of mistaken for a refugee myself because I, mean, I scanned as a as a sort of dark skinned possibly Arab person, and so that would be a either a sort of it would be a very strange experience either either way. Either people would be in a very exaggerated. Sort of wanting to demonstrate their hospitality towards me or, or would be openly hostile. So the new Germany was part of this in this kind of conversation about migration, about belonging, about all these um, kind of atavistic questions about the Volk and the nation that, you know, people I think we imagined might have been buried once and for all by by the events of the 20th century, but which are back with us. And, and, and certainly being in Germany at a point when, when that was causing real anxiety and was playing out in, you know, in everyday life, you know, it would be for me, it would be going into a shop and seeing whether they would serve me or whether they would pretend I wasn't there or um, encountering people who were, you know, working very hard perhaps to try and assimilate uh the new you know refugees um so it's so yeah the history and the present day of berlin imposed itself on this set of questions that i'd started to think about uh about um about the kind of consensus and 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 it's and it's breakdown it's really it's really interesting because you get the the sort of the sort of i guess the the return of some of these ideas of the Vogue and, and white supremacy and stuff. But on the other hand, there's another <laughs> aspect of the novel, which is to do with kind of surveillance and privacy mm -hmm. and the erosion of that, which I guess you're, we're speaking now about perhaps the other totalitarianism and the, the idea of the Stasi and total surveillance and, and, uh, and you know, the, the, the narrator of the story becoming increasingly anxious about how this, um, how his own, how he himself is being surveilled, how he, he's, uh, you know, every keystroke is being recorded in this is slightly uh, s sinister fellowship venue. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the start of the novel for me, or the kind of the, the sort of kernel of it, was about selfhood and was about surveillance. Um, and I mean, I made this character a non-fiction writer who's got a rather pretentious project to do with lyric poetry and the self. And there is in you know in, there is in the sort of the tradition of the lyric this this notion of it's the self in conversation with itself the lyric eye of 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 the poem is is a sort of um it's a particularly sort of luxurious subjectivity it's a subjectivity that's involved in this kind of contemplation and 
you know, the ways we think about selfhood are very wrapped up with privacy and with a kind of interior space that's inviolate and that we then sort of go out from this interiority into the world, into the social world and make some sort of presentation of ourselves. And one of the experiences I think everybody is having is, is, is of a, is of a diminution of that space of interiority. And I mean, I mean, I mean, a lot of it, we, you know, we woke up one morning and realized we've been kind of conned into giving away a lot of our privacy that we were being, uh, we are being tracked and metricated and understood in, uh, in aggregate in ways that we, we didn't predict. What we wanted to do was get a map on our phone and, 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 uh, be able to kind of text our friends. But I mean, my, so my question to myself was, um, what what effect does this have uh you know if, if you if you if you agree with the case that that new technologies and especially kind of in the internet is in some way um reducing our scope for for privacy which i think is is true i think we behave now in the knowledge that we are actually or potentially being watched or overheard i mean i still can't can't quite kind of remember that i walk into houses all the time where they have a smart speaker in the room that will is a voice triggered thing that there is a something is listening to our conversation i mean i find that deeply dystopian um but clearly my some of my friends quite like to be able to say switch on the lights or play me dire straits whatever it is <laughs> Dude, i'm not sure that's a good trade-off but i mean but that but this but, i mean the, the 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 serious point being that um if you if you are aware sort of somewhere deep down that you might be held to account for your actions that you or, or ways you're behaving in in this sort of pseudo private space then you you've lost that sense of privacy. I mean, privacy is a sort of sandbox. It's a way you experiment with selfhood before you go out and 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 say this is who I am and this is what I believe. And and um and so my question is, is firstly, what 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 does that mean for the human? You know that that kind of that a category that we spent a lot of a lot of uh, a sort of generation or so picking apart. And 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 there I mean there reasons to be skeptical of of the human as the, the end and measure of all things especially in a in terms of trying to kind of understand environment the environment and our relationship to the world but there's also things that attach to the human that seem quite useful like i mean what happens to human rights if you don't have a solid notion of the human and if your notion of the human is in some way um bound up with a, a kind of dignity that comes along with privacy then what 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 does that mean and so i was thinking about all these things and i it, it came up at a point when i was going to go and be in berlin for six months and of course as you say the stasi legacy is is still very very present there and the stasi developed this um a sort of technology of uh mining people really i mean it's i mean god knows what they would have done with the current technologies but even you know given what they had in the you know up until the 1980s they you know they they there was a stasi university in potsdam quite close to where i was staying where you could go and 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 study psycho psychology and they were they were very big into behaviorism they liked skinner and 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 kind of uh that sort of model and but they were very interested in how you would disrupt um not just networks of dissidents, but actually the kind of psychology of individual dissidents. So they 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 made a study of things in ways you could under. I mean, they called it zazetsung, corrosion or undermining, and they did this very systematic work of of trying to kind of psychologically undermine people who were enemies of the regime or who they suspected of being enemies of the regime, and they did that in ways that seemed sort of strange and petty. They would they would put teams of uh, of agents on a on a, a target and then just basically mess with you it was almost like prank pranking people like you go into the store and somebody lets your bike tires down um that like you send a, a a package and they make sure that it gets lost um they you they go into your apartment when you're not there and they move things around in ways that just show you that you don't have a space of privacy that you know if they lay your personal photos out on the bed Firstly, you know somebody's been there, and secondly, you have a you have a sense that you don't have this um, 
way of kind of you know, this, this 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 secure place that you can go out and 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 start from and they they did uh, it gets much more elaborate from that i mean i've i read one report about them I, i'm trying to undermine an artist in i think it was dresden and and they 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 ransacked his uh, studio making it look as if there'd been a burglary and then left a drawing in the style of one of his friends so that he would begin to suspect that this particular friend was in some way behind the the, the theft. I mean, they did a lot of, um, have you heard that Dave is sleeping with your girlfriend kind of things to make, to make, to, to cause dissent and, and uh, between people. I mean, these are that, those are sort of secret police techniques that have been used with opposition groups around the world, but the Stasi were particularly systematic and well resourced and and relentless and 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 they caused such sort of psychological damage to some of their targets there's there's still a psychologist in in berlin today whose practice is is almost exclusively with with former uh stasi victims you know some of whom have never really been able to trust other people at all since since that that period and so as a result of that, I mean, contemporary Germans are very, are very alive to invasions of privacy. I mean, if you go on um, Google Street View in Berlin, you'll find a lot of a lot of addresses are blurred out. There's a law that that says that that has to happen if you can, if you want if you don't want to have your property uh, visible on Street View, and also any, anywhere like a, a a kindergarten or anywhere associated with children is not shown. And there are various other other reasons that that buildings get blurred out, but they have a they have a an idea of privacy that is 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 quite kind of founded in in that experience and i think it's slightly different from the american thinking about privacy which is i mean one opposition i i heard is a sort of quick and dirty opposition is that the sort of german idea is based on dignity and human dignity and and, and america the american idea is based on liberty um which clearly leads to some, some slightly different sorts of uh conclusions but so so starting off i mean berlin immediately got wrapped up into that project in various uh, uh, other ways and then and then of course the kind of my migrant crisis was was in full swing and you know and then that I, I mean, that sort of happens to me when i'm writing a book my books always sort of become these i don't know big bags into which <laughs> which all my all the things kind of get get put so so um, it was somehow inevitable that all this material would need to be processed through this story. And is it, I mean, it, and stories and, and sort of fiction especially seems to be an interesting way of, of thinking about privacy and interiority and, and like where the conversations we have with ourselves, how we kind of form it, which so obviously is very interesting to the that this that your narrator here sort of begin he, he feels very unsettled that there's something missing or that there's an absence or um, hollow inside inside of him until of course you know he gets into this uh, this confrontation with this alt right figure that then um, really as he was saying earlier gets under his skin and really kind of shakes him sort of pretty foundationally until we're not really starting to not to worry about whether what he's telling us is really happening or not within his world yeah i mean the the the, the question i mean obviously the, the unreliable nat narrator is a is a is a is a a go-to for the novelist but the, i mean the the novel is as you say it's a really interesting place to do this particular kind of work because the novel is foundationally about character um and, and 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 characters in novels behave in 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 ways that are, i mean in, in a funny way that often is much has much more to do with the tradition of character in the novel than it does to do with any actual human psychology i mean we we used to things being explicable in in character terms in novels you know the the serial killer is a serial killer because he was kept under the stairs in the coal cellar uh, you know, I mean, we that kind that that's a comforting thing, even if you're you know you're dealing with a discomforting thing like serial killers is 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 um, explanation and sort of a certain sort of levels of explanation. But what's what's much more unsettling is the idea that selfhood is is much less continuous and secure and and explicable than novels often often. Um, often often tell us i mean i i 
I mean, another another element in the stew of of red pill is my reading of a of a German philosopher, contemporary German philosopher called Thomas Metzinger, uh, who's who's known. As a, he's what he's a very sort of uh, um, scientifically inclined philosopher who works a lot with uh, uh, um, you know um, sci- various kinds of mind related scientists. I mean the the, the um, uh, cognitive scientists and so on, but if he's he's convinced that the the self doesn't really exist, and that uh, and that we in some way generate uh, an illusion of selfhood as a kind of convenient. It's almost like a sort of scratch pad, a way of keeping certain things together for the mind to to be able to process the the sort of storm of experience. You know, if you have a feeling of here-ness and you have a feeling of nowness. I mean, that's essentially what the self is, you know, I mean, it's, 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 I'm having this experience in this determinate place and it's taking place now. Um, he feels that that's a sort of uh, a convenience for the, the, the brain, the brain puts together and doesn't have any really profound uh, uh, truth to it or kind of, um, and, and I, I mean, as soon as you start thinking like that, you know, you, you're saying goodbye to the sort of psychology that novelists are, uh, uh are prone to to selling to their to their readers and um and that you know that's um that's also very interesting to me this kind of unraveling of 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 a tradition of 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 selfhood you know and and um so you know i mean is it like all novels at some way in some way it, it's about novels and it's about i mean it's about uh that a, a kind a kind you know it's a, it, it has that sort of self-reflexive character to it but uh but i mean you know what if you do look inside and there's nobody there what if you look inside and there is no i to be found you know what uh what what then um what happens to all the sort of meanings and values that we attach to that and that's that's a sort of deep, profoundly unsettling thought and it's a thought that is certainly from a cognitive science point of view, is kind of creeping in around around the edges, and you know you, a lot of sort of humanities types are basically going kind of la 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 and ignoring it. Weird things to talk about as well as we're sort of projected on little screens and yes, know, yes. Um, the I mean another sort of train of influence, obviously, that runs through this is much less highbrow than than um, contemporary German philosophy is is the alt-right that we've been talking about. And you do, you know, you've written about this. I think there's this, uh, um, it, it was one of sort of an article that educated me in the New York Review of Books about some of the stuff that was going on. You, I mean, this is not, you're not responding to this, uh, you know, uh, 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 now that most of us are learning about things like QAnon. This is something that you've sort of, you've been a bit of a canary in the coal mine with some of this stuff like 4chan and... Um, I mean, I'm... <laughs> It's a mildly paranoid person, and uh, I've had an internet <laughs> connection since the early nineties. And um, very, I came very early on when I had an internet connection. You know, back in the days of of of, of, sort of noisy modems and and you know going to make a cup of tea while the web page downloaded. I you know I discovered there was already a sort of far right community on the internet but 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 being able to have to sort of go in and see how these people were talking to each other was very interesting to me like i mean you know the it's you know being a being a fly on the wall in various subcultural spaces is one of the one of the great joys of the internet in a way and one of the so i mean i've always i've i've you know i do it intermittently and and in a slightly sort of self-hating ways i do occasionally just, i i hang around and in, in various sort of right-wing spaces and and try and work out how they're speaking to each other and what they're actually thinking i mean and there's a there is a kind of intellectual current to what's what's going on as well but then there is also this this kind of soup of meme making and jokes and culture. I mean, there is a, there is for want of a better word, a rather vibrant culture that has got, I mean, it's really changed in the last kind of 15, 20 years. You know, when I first had contact with that stuff, it was fairly, you know, it was the same old sort of bonehead idiots kind of talking about the Holocaust in a way that was never going to appeal outside their very limited world. But 
then in the early aughts, they sort of discovered irony in this culture that, that, that sort of grew up around message boards and then is partly migrated to places like Telegram now and Discord servers and is slightly less outwardly facing. <clears throat> um, they were generating, I mean, I went on this site, 4chan, which had became notorious for its sort of involvement in bringing President Trump to power. Um, I was on there in like sort of 2004, I think, something like that. And I was, I was sort of appalled and fascinated. There was this kind of, people called them edgelords now. It was a sort of, a thing of kind of go, being one more outrageous than the last person and, 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 and being un, pretend, apparently being unshockable. I mean, a real sort of teenage boy driven worldview. Um, and there was this kind of, there was this extreme racism, extreme misogyny, and a kind of disgusting shock culture. But also, it, it had a kind of compelling sort of um, arms race quality to it. There were all these people there egging them, egging each other on, and they had developed a complicated system of in jokes and uh, you know what we now think know as as memes that. Uh, you know, and now, I mean, it's a kind of way of a way of communicating that spread all around. But I mean, for, you know, for a long time, all sorts of things that would, would pop up in the mainstream media, like Pepe the Frog, the the cartoon frog who who kind of became a sort of outright mascot. Um, you know, mo much of this had been incubated in this world of the Chans for, for long periods before it turned up in more mainstream spaces. And some of them, they sort of latched on to Trump and, and the possibilities of Trump as a, as a kind of disruptive figure, because he was, I mean, you know, a, he's a he's a shit poster i mean trump trump is trump is 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 you know he, he has a he had a sense or has a sense of of just really how to annoy the people that they like to annoy and there's nothing more fun on the chance than an outraged liberal i mean there's a there's a there's a cartoon there's a the the a soy face they call him this is this particular kind i mean it's got a beard rather like me i mean you know it, it has a and has this kind of like quality to him that you know and 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 the, the sort of the shock ability and the kind of endless ability of of the same liberal people to be kind of triggered by the by you saying the same stuff was was very very funny as far as they're concerned and once you're kind of in you're sort of seeing it through their eyes you know it, it you know it becomes less like oh no you're doing it again you're falling once again liberal commentator in large uh media outlet you are how you have no idea the extent to which you're being laughed at as you hand ring about the the racist thing that you've just found or the you know the sexist thing that you've just found on the internet and um and that kind of space of of, of ironic joking has become really politically important and became a vehicle for so smuggling a lot of very extreme ideas into the mainstream i mean that again the uh, the sort of circle around Trump started using it, this thing about you should take him seriously, but not literally, I think was that, a, that was Kellyanne Conway said that in response to some garbage that had come out of his mouth. And, 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 um, but this, this space where you can, you can say something that's outrageous, that's beyond the pale. And then when you're challenged on it to say, well, you didn't take me seriously, did you? But you put it out there, you made it, you've made it a possibility. And that's been a way of, of shifting what they call the Overton window, the window of acceptable discourse has, has certainly shifted rightwards in the last few years and, and has opened up to all sorts of ideas that, as I say, I think we, we thought were dead and buried, been a particularly biological racism and various sorts of atavistic nationalism. Yeah, it's interesting. It seems also to, to sort of have spilled now back out into quote unquote reality, like into the way that some of this politics, I'm thinking about the let's go Brandon stuff and the That's okay perfect people. example, isn't it? There, you know, yeah. you can, I'm just saying let's go Brandon, but we yeah. all know. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's a kind of style of discourse that is, was incubated in this online culture in the early aughts and is now, it's now how we do politics. It's now how, how we talk and even how, I mean, Paul Gosar, the, the congressman who was censured today, was censured because his staff who were all absolutely Chan kids, they are 
they are out of this culture. They they used a, an anime clip that circulates in in the far right, and they you know they stuck his face on one figure and and, and AOC's face on another, and you know and made a kind of winking death threat that they clearly thought they would probably get away with, and actually you know maybe people are catching up to the fact that you have to you know you 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 know you can't get kind of mired in this joking not joking space which allows them to make threats and and and, and do this kind of thing with impunity but it is it's also you know it's a recipe for conspiracy and paranoia in a, in a weird way like you're you know you're you there's there's codes out there that you and when you i mean i'm just like the sort of the general consumer of of, of the kind of the political landscape is you know, you're, you're constantly having to catch up, I guess, to, to some of the the way these these political memes are, are being generated. It's it's fascinating. I mean, the I mean, we have. Um, I think one of the experiences of of existing in contemporary culture is is an experience of excess mm. and of a kind of paranoia that comes with feeling that you don't quite understand because it's not it's not possible to to get every gag. Mm. I mean, every you know, I mean, I spend quite a lot of my time sort of forensically reconstructing conversations that I've walked in halfway through on some place on the internet to try and work out what on earth people are talking about and they all seem to know so we i mean i think all of us have this experience of like being the the one in the room who doesn't get it and and the the just the sheer information overload of the internet enabled culture means that we're sort of desperate for certain kinds of simplification and one of those kinds of simplification is conspiracy theory because conspiracy theories offer a determinate, easy solution for very, very socially complex and nuanced things. You know, if you can say the reason the world is a bad place is because there's 12 guys in Zurich who are in a boardroom, you know, cooking up badness. And if, or, you know, if only you could break down the door and, you know, arrest them all, then it would all be fine. I mean, that, I mean, that's essentially what Q is. I mean, Q... Q is a sort of revitalized version of a kind of Christian millenarianism that's been around in America forever, but with the unlikely uh, <laughs> the sort of Trumpian eschatology is, is very sort of bizarre. I mean, but, but yeah, I mean, Trump is the savior figure who, even though he appears a certain way on the surface behind the scenes, has got, you know, he's got an ankle bracelet on Pelosi and Biden's already been taken away to the slammer. And, you know, the, the millennium is coming. The, the, the golden age is, 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 is imminent. And, and, and you as the soldiers of Q as, as, as the, the followers of Trump are, are going, you know, are going to bring it about. And the evil is so, what's more evil than um, the cannibalism of children, which is, you know, which is what they got themselves to with the, the supposed basement under the pizza restaurant, which had no basement. And uh, the, you know, the, the, the evil is kind of, you know, is, is, is epically evil. And, and the good is, is unquestionably, unquestionably righteous. And the irony of it, of course, is the whole, Q thing was being run by a father and son team of pornographers based in, you know, but I think it's based, they were based in Bangkok, the Watkins fathers, I can't remember exactly, but the, but the, they are, the, you know, the, the, you know, some, some fairly sleazy people were running a site and making a whole bunch of money on the back of people's wish for you know wish for purity and goodness and and uh, and the pandemic came along and and has has isolated people still further made everybody much more dependent on this this um sort of slew of information coming out of their computers and people are not well equipped to to parse what's a good source from what's a bad source and 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 what's reasonable from what's not i mean we're, we're very bad at, at actually doing this particular kind of cognitive work and uh, and and hence hence the mess we're in <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean it makes i mean and you know historically it's it's a sort of weird flip that's happened because you know you go back to the 60s and 70s and a lot of the paranoia and conspiracy was about the government and it often was coming from the left sometimes it was pretty well founded as some of the later revelations uh, especially about for example the cia or the fbi revealed um 
and yet suddenly we've flipped into the position now where you know you've had people on the left championing the FBI and the CIA and its mm. efforts to fight. You know, it's a it's a strange historical time. I mean, and it's very interesting that that exactly that culture, the culture of of, of hostility to government and 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 a sort of sixties crunchy paranoia has been a sort of main vector of of Q and other and other sort of ideas into the mainstream I and mean, it's very established i mean the word i like i like that the people use for it is conspirituality that there that, that alternative cultures like yoga and wellness and and various sorts of you know things one traditionally thinks of as liberal or left or whatever i mean are, are actually have been kind of often fully captured by uh by these kind of um conspiracy theories that act that are in their effect anti-democratic so in a certain way the kind of it's not really the sort of left right binary isn't much use to us in in analyzing the effects of you know the way the way conspiracy is actually spreading culturally because there there's there are there are left friendly conspiracy circles and right friendly conspiracy circles and um and yeah i mean people people who you know, have have a have you know, sort of a, as you say, well founded reasons to be suspicious of 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 people in government telling you what the truth is. Find themselves in the un, unusual position of defending mainstream sources of information or authority. Mm -hmm. I mean, the question of what what is a what is a properly constituted authority is what's is precisely what's in play right now, and and. Um, you know this idea of the MSM, the mainstream media, as a sort of as a sort of hegemonic holder of authority, but an illegitimate one, is very central to the, you know, to both the, you know, the, the sort of yoga conspiracy mom and and the the far right young kind of identity Europa dude with the with the tiki torch. I mean, they you know they converge on on the you know on, in the sort of with the same sort of enemy that looks like Nancy Pelosi. <laughs> um, I'm wondering whether we can open up towards some questions, but um, maybe these will help us keep talking about some of this stuff. The first is actually is from my colleague, Patrick Whitmarsh, uh, who asks um, if you could say a little bit more about your more recent American novels, Americana novels, namely Gods Without Men and White Tears. Uh, your early work deals with issues of British imperialism and post-colonial subjectivities. Can you say more about your shift towards distinctly US-centric concerns, or perhaps you don't see these as US-centric concerns? Well, I mean, I mean, there's a there's a sort of boring level to that answer, which is which is in 2008 I moved to the US, and and you know, as I as I sort of said with the reference to Red Pill, is, is there's a certain element of that I, I'm I'm inevitably right about what's in front of my knows and um certainly when i gods without men which is a novel that's set all in the southwestern desert in the mojave desert was a was a way of me i mean it, it, i mean it's sort, of, it's sort of a novel about god but it's also but it is a sort of novel about about um, america and 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 a sort of uh, expansive geography, I think that that was a, was one of the things that confronted me by moving to the the US. I mean, I live in New York, and but for one reason or another, I started soon soon after I came to make these very long solo road trips in the desert. And um, the desert is a a space that's associated with certain kinds of transcendence, you know. In, Jesus goes out into the desert in order to kind of have a have an experience of of God, and the title of that novel is a is a is a quote from Balzac, where in an old soldier, one of Napoleon's Grand Armée soldiers who's served in Egypt, is asked, you know, what what's the desert like, and he says it's uh, it it's uh, God without man, and this sort of absence of of human scale and this absence of the social world is very interesting you, know, you find yourself alone in, a, in in space and of course the southwestern desert in the u.s has this particular culture I mean, the ufo culture as a kind of homegrown religion which i i i, should, I could talk about for a long time but i, I was probably i was sort of pull back from my uh sort of rabbit hole about that but that i mean that 
that's absolutely about that. And then, and then, white tears, which which you you trailed a little bit in the beginning, about about the the the, the blues. I mean, the blues music interests me because it is such a sort of figure for authenticity in a certain sort of a uh, 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 way. I mean, if you're a, if you're an advertiser wanting to kind of quickly signify the real America, you might stick a, a, a kind of old bluesman, you know, playing a, a steel guitar on a, on a porch. And, and, and yet the blues has become very hollowed out and has become, and of course, as you, as you'll know, the, the British managed to sell the blues back to Americans through bands like the Rolling Stones and Led Zeppelin and so on. So there's this profound inauthenticity in the, in the kind mixed in with this figure of authenticity. And it was, I was writing at a time when I was really trying to get to grips with the racial politics here, which are different from, from the one, from the ones I grew up with. I mean, as, as your colleague says, my early work is very concerned with the sort of imperial legacy and about finding my own position within that and, and as a product of that history. And I came to the US and I hadn't, I mean, you know, I, I considered myself a fairly well-informed person and I knew my civil rights history and so on and so forth, but I hadn't quite understood the level to which um, the conversation about race or the kind of the unresolved issues about race still poison everyday life here. Um, and, and, I, and as I kind of thought about that and tried to find ways of, of understanding that, it, I mean, the, the idea of the ghost story kind of pushed itself forward because I mean, ghost stories are, are all about things from the past that are not done with, that are not resolved. You know, the, the, it's it, things from the, the past that is not completely past, you know, the, the, the undead is, un, you know, the, is, has been buried, but has not, is not actually, is not actually dead. I mean, there's no, there's a reason that so many American horror stories take place on the old native burial ground. Um, and then this kind of anxiety and this kind of anxiety about history and about uh, uh, about genocide and about I mean, and, uh, and about slavery kind of permeate the everyday because they're not dealt with because they haven't been faced and resolved and and there are still things that are ongoing about them. So I mean that led me towards wanting to write to write a ghost story centered around around the blues and at the same time. Uh, I fell among 78 record collectors and they're a particularly extreme sort of uh, type of record collector. I mean, the, I mean it's collecting 78s is, 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 a, is, a, is a sort of minority subculture within record collecting. And, and often because, I mean, a lot of these records, again, another rabbit hole, which I will attempt to skirt the edges of, the, uh, the 78 often you can be a collector of a record and have the only copy or, or, or have, have, uh, have uh, basically be in a position where you're sort of gatekeeping this culture as the, as the owner of a particularly rare record. And, and then in, in a lot of cases now, I mean, people are really acting as extraordinary archivists and, uh, and, uh, and making new cultural narratives out of collecting uh, music from the early days of recorded sound. Maybe it's, it's impossible for anybody to to become a proper seventy eight blues collector now because all the records are too expensive and they're all kind of held by the same half a dozen uh, people. So I mean, a lot of younger collectors are going. Uh, I mean, people are getting into um, I don't know, Javanese court gamelan uh, or a nineteen twenties Japanese popular music or things you know there are areas which you can kind of collect and and and, and become a uh an expert in and without having to sort of drop fifteen thousand dollars on a on a robert johnson record or whatever um yeah i mean i am a collector i'm a kind of habitual sort of hoarder i mean my friend of mine told me that that every place she's ever been in that i've i've lived in looks like a secondhand bookstore and i you know i hold my hand up to that that's who I am. I'm in a kind of accumulator of ephemera of one kind or another. Um, I'm just going to go to the, another question from, from the audience. We have uh, Elisa uh, Sotkiw. I'm sorry if I'm butchering your name, Elisa, but um, 
she writes, while you're reading the beginning of Red Pill, it came to mind that many contemporary novels begin with a kind of essayistic bit that then develops into first person narration. She gives a couple of examples. Um, and she asked if that was a kind of conscious choice. And in, in more general, how do you feel, how, how do you balance the need to tell a story with the kind of bag of ideas that are coming to you, I think is how you phrased it earlier. I'm, I'm always very jealous of people who can write a kind of light autofiction with a sort of, you know, with a sort of placeholder eye that then allows them to digress interestingly about, you know, whatever films or books they've seen recently. Um, I, I, I mean, I'm kind of, uh, I'm, I'm, quite, I like stories. I mean, I, I mean, it's, I, and I'm, I mean, I'm quite interested in, in, um, in the pleasures of, of narrative. And, then, and, and every time I, I attempt to make, make a kind of, uh, you know, one of these, the sort of books that I, I think she's describing, I, I, I kind of end up, you know, much further into making stuff up than, uh, than, than, some other people go. So, I mean, I, I wish I could say that I was fully in control, but I mean, it's essentially, I think I think you're the kind of writer you are and you're, I mean, your interests and your ways of being kind of come out involuntarily, no matter what you're trying to write. I mean, every every book I write, I think I'm, I'm doing a particular kind of new thing. And then it turns out to be a book that seems like a book I would have written. So, yeah, I mean, I, I, that's not an answer really, but that, that's what I have for you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, what I will say, my experience of reading you is often that that the, that there, you know, even the let's say with Red Pill, that you get this sort of the sensation of this this guy who's kind of not really sure about what's necessarily wrong with him, but that the, there's things that he's not seeing or he, things that maybe he's only partially picking up that you, you're seeding for the reader, and that there is a very sort of careful structure here. Like this is, you know, as somebody who who. Uh, did some work within the book of it. it's that kind of level of sort of detail that that I find incredibly appealing as a read those little easter eggs I think sometimes they get caught yes I mean I, I like I like making things that have levels I mean I, I, I like I like a book that I like to make a book that you, you, one can read almost like a sort of, sort of thriller paced story but if you want to dwell that there are other levels that you can go to and that they have been placed and that they have been controlled I mean as like you I appreciate that when I realize that, that there's that sort of level of care a writer has taken and that there are certain things that you know if, if you know you know <laughs> to, you know but you don't necessarily need to to go there to to enjoy the the story yeah which you know is that you get the sort of the signs and symbols of uh no which in 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 the context of something like red pill becomes very loaded because then it kind of invites you into almost like a well a paranoid kind of like like attempt to make meaning out of all these different pieces yeah i mean i'm quite attracted to the the opposition that deleuze and Guattari have between between schizophrenia and paranoia not as clinical things but as kind of structures in that you know i mean the uh, they talk about the happy schizophrenic going for a walk by which they mean uh, a kind of connectivity that gives pleasure that everything is connected uh, and paranoia and, and fear come in with the idea that there is some sort of controlling mm -hmm. element that is, is in charge of this arrangement uh, that you're not quite understanding that, you know, you maybe there's a threat or maybe, you know, you're, you know, there's some, something that's going to, uh, that you need to know that you don't know. So there's, I mean, I think we, we, you know, as a way of describing how we exist as readers, I think though that's quite an interesting opposition. You know, I mean, I mean, obviously the terminology is very loaded, and 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 you know, I mean, it's really not a way of talking about uh, clinical mental illness. It's a way of a way of describing certain sorts of experience of going through the forest of signs. You know, whether. Oh look, there's you know, here, I'm going to click on another link. There's another thing that's connected to this thing, and that's a pleasure. Or like I don't understand, and they might be coming to kill me. <laughs> so, well, you know, we're in, we exist in some sort of you know uh, in, intermediate space between those two poles. Yeah, um, that's uh, really fascinating. I wonder if I could just um, briefly return to to white te uh, white tears before we wrap up, and and um, you know talk a bit. Uh, I'd love to hear you talk a little more as somebody who has also sort of moved to this country a little later than you, 
but about, um, you know, writing about the American subject, writing about American history, writing about um, black history in the US. Um, you know, the, the, the sort of the, the crime or the, the, the kind of the transgression in the novel is an act of appropriation, almost a cultural appropriation by these two sort of young white hipstery types who, who, who kind of make up a, a, a sort of authentic sounding blues record. I mean, I know you've probably been asked about this a number of times since that novel came out, but was that something that was playing on your mind as you're writing? Of course, I mean, you know, I think, I think, you know, you're, I, I'm trying to stage exactly that. I mean, and, and, um, you know, I mean, I mean, there's a certain, there's a certain uh, thing about being, being an outsider to that conversation, which, you, you know, the, the standard way, way of approaching that situation is to say, I have no right to speak, therefore I will remain silent. But this is a conversation which, which, if you have a slightly confused and confusing relation to it, it, you can kind of enter it in a in a sort of sideways fashion. I mean, I think, you know, I don't think I don't think Why It Is is a book that any uh, Black American would write because they would center it somewhere else. They would they would the, the center of the story would be elsewhere, and a. Uh, and it would be hard for a white American to write a book that in which white people behave in these appropriative and, and in sometimes racist ways without that confusion between writer and character becoming kind of problematic for them. And so, I, I mean, as somebody who, who I, mean, I mean, authority is not quite the right word, but I have a particular experience of, of sort of being a racialized subject but it comes from another context and so i mean uh, i've blundered into the middle of this place where i have no business being and 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 i'm trying to kind of stay in the in the anxiety in the kind of spot where the uns the, the the thing that's difficult to talk about is 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 happening and and and, and appropriation in music is is very interesting to me i mean i, I you know as a as a british person I grew up with a great deal of black American music, but, but I had the music, but not the people and the absence of, of uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, having the cultural product without the people who made that culture was one of my, you know, became more and more sort of peculiar to me as years, as the years went on as a sort of unselfconscious teenager, I would listen to sort of hip hop and soul music and reggae music as well, a lot of reggae music. And not quite, kind, not quite, kind of understand my position in relation to that. And then, you know, coming coming here and being kind of confronted in a much more direct way with with uh, the history and um, with people, with real people, uh, as was 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 a reason for trying to write that book. But you know, so I. Yeah, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a, I'm a lover of music. I'm a fan, and I'm interested in that sort of difference between loving something and trying to own it or profit from it, which is maybe a way of kind of, you know, slicing that kind of question of appropriation up in a way that allows, you know, I mean, you know, what you want to say is that there are, you know, extraordinary works of art like. And I'd, I'd love Supreme by John Coltrane that you want to say that speak in the way that great art speaks. It has to have a, you know, it must, it must be able to speak outside its cultural context and it must be able to speak to all sorts of people. But at the same time, it's come out of a particular experience and it's come out of a particular um, history uh, and you can love it, but you know, it doesn't belong to you in a certain way or it doesn't belong to me in a certain uh, way. And um Trying to understand that was another reason to write this book and to put my own relationship to Black American music into play in 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 the novel. Has it been has it been strange, sort of, as you know, so sort of reckoning with this with with the sort of the histories and the politics of your adopted home, seeing some of the things that you were writing about and talking about back in the UK now, you know, being. I hesitate to say reckoned with, um, but you know, the, the the discourse has certainly shifted in the UK. To, to, for example, thinking about legacies of empire, institutional racism. I mean, I know you know we had things like after Stephen Lawrence, there was a sort of 
pseudo reckoning, but like, you know, that now it's, it's sort of feels very much out in the open. Um, but then it's strange also being very distant from that. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I mean, I, I feel I'm, I'm at a stage where I've been away long enough that I, there are, there are nuances that I don't understand about, about the ways these things are being talked about in the UK right now. My sense of the, the, the moment that the UK is in sort of post Brexit and with this, uh, with this particular, uh, flavor of Tory government is, is that there is a, um, there's a there's a there's a sort of pushback against uh, against a kind of um notion of multicultural britain that uh i mean i i mean i i i was a teenager in the 80s and i was in my 20s in the 90s and and having 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 had quite uh let's say a thin time of it as a as a as a teenager um i you know and i and a, and a kind of experience of of uh british racism that that left me feeling fairly cynical about things the 90s felt like a very an exciting opening up and there was a there was a there was a sort of uh, a, a new kind of culture in which i was able to participate and 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 feel that i could be british i could be me and i could be fully british um and then there is a, the, I mean, the, the sort of hysteria around the National Trust. I mean, I suppose we should we should kind of gloss this for <laughs> for an American audience. Is that that I mean, as far as I could see, a very anodyne report was was made by the National Trust, which is the body that uh, that uh, administrates various historic buildings uh, for the nation. They wanted to sort of do some sort of audit about about the legacy of of slavery and colonialism, and obviously it was endless Indian nabobs and sugar barons, and there's a lot of as a lot of capital had been transferred to Britain and and ended up as 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 you know, nice 18th century houses, and they wanted to kind of make that history visible and talk about that and talk about that legacy, and that and that was howled down the 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 I believe the the director or the, the chair of the National Trust was forced to resign for commissioning this report for even daring to to broach this question. And and it's so sort of it, it is, a, you know, it's a very the nervousness about acknowledging the history has kind, you know, is, is a is 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 a way of kind of reinforcing certain sorts of of power in the in the present day and i mean i and i think there's a, there's been a very strong pushback against the kind of uh uh openness that were that seemed to be emerging in the 90s and early noughts and i mean i'm sort of quite glad that i'm not in it i mean i feel like i would i would be getting yelled at all day and every day by people in the comment section and um in you know in in some way you know sometimes I feel I feel mildly guilty about not 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 kind of you know being there to 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 fight my corner in 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 some way but um you know everything everything in the sort of post Brexit Britain seems seems to be conducted at this pitch of hysteria that uh, that is is sort of terribly wearing I do. I do. I, I mean, I, I guiltily close down the newspaper website sometimes, thinking, "Thank God nobody's phoning me to ask why, you know, ask me to weigh in on on whatever we're all shouting at each other about today." I mean, there is one good thing in Britain at the moment, which is the the reissue of June has your foreword in it. Um, oh yeah, I've, I actually finally got. A, I actually got a physical copy out to so yell at them times. So I can show you. There it is with it with uh, this. With this oh, brilliant look at that, I mean, yeah. books weren't like that when I was a as a kid. So, um, so yes, I got to I got to have participate in the general Dune mania by writing a writing an essay about uh, uh, Frank Herbert. Well, be better better ending on Dune than Brexit. Have you seen, <laughs> have you seen the new film? I have actually. I think they've done pretty well. I mean, I mean, I'm such a sort of sucker for it. I even like the David Lynch version but i think that, you know i think this is pretty good i'm hoping for uh they give zendaya some more lines in the next in the in the next one i mean the current currently she sort of sort of wanders around the desert looking like she's in a perfume advert so i think they could yeah, do more with her uh but you know i think chalamet is a pretty good paul atreides i'm mm -hmm. i'm in favor 
Good. No, fantastic. Well, um, uh, thank you so much, Harry, for chatting with us tonight. It's been a fun conversation about, uh, uh, um, you know, these fantastic recent novels you've written. And I would encourage people to go back into your uh, catalogue and, and, and uh, um, uh, you know, read what, what I think is, a, is a, you know, one of the um, most important oeuvres of a fiction writer in uh, the contemporary moment. So thanks for sharing your, um, uh, your time with us tonight. It was a, a real pleasure chatting with you. Harry. Well, thanks, thanks so much for, for talking, Doug. I really enjoyed myself. Oh, fantastic. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for joining uh, and good night. And hopefully we'll see you um, in the spring for the next installment of Writers Speak.